Hello everyone, welcome to another new episode of ESL Talk. Thank you so much for joining us again for another great episode today. We're going to be talking about making the leap into ESL. Even though we have teachers of all different ranges of experience, backgrounds and knowledge levels, it's still really important to give a helping hand to those new teachers or those who are just starting out in the journey. I know we speak quite often to teachers who want to get started teaching online. They don't know where to begin or they don't really know what steps to take. So what we'll do today is we'll speak to our special guest, Erica, and she's going to share with us how she made the leap into ESL teaching online. And also she's going to share a little bit about how this podcast helped her too, which is really, um, really nice to hear as well. So we'll get into that shortly. But before we do, we just have a couple of announcements that we need to make before we get started in today's episode. So first of all, if you're not already, please do give us a follow on Instagram at ESL Talk Podcast. We're up to about 3,500 followers right now, but if you do enjoy what we do and you'd like to support us and find out a little bit more about our guests and the episodes, feel free to follow us on Instagram. We also now have a YouTube channel, which is up and running. You can find that on our website by just going to esl-talk.com where you can click the link for YouTube so you can watch and listen to all of our episodes if that's what you prefer. And you can also get access to all of our previous episodes on the website as well. One other thing, if you'd like to become a guest on future episodes, we get requests every week. So we have a really nice um, list of amazing and wide ranging topics that we're going to discuss in future episodes. You can also do that on the website. Just go to the website esl-talk.com, click the button be a guest, and then you can just fill in a few short details and apply to be on a future episode, which is great because, again, we've got lots of fantastic episodes upcoming over the next few weeks. So looking forward to meeting you, interviewing you, and having you on the podcast as well. And just one more thing, if you're not already subscribed, please do subscribe to us on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts and do leave us a review. It really does help us with the algorithm and to help us grow and to build every week. So if you could do that, that would be really appreciated. And then, of course, if you need resources, materials, ESL lesson plans, we have you covered with our partners at esl-curriculum.com. That's Crystal Clear ESL, where we can give you up to 600 plus interactive ready-made ESL lessons. Simply just log in, find the level or the type of English that you teach, and you can get started with all the materials there and a two-week free trial at esl-curriculum.com. All right, so I think it's about that time to get into today's interview. We're going to be speaking to our guest, Erica, who's going to talk to us about how she made the leap into teaching ESL online and share her experiences as a non-native English speaker teaching online, how she overcame those challenges and how you could do that as well. So let's get started with today's interview. Thank you. I'm here with Erica for this part, uh, for this week's interview. Hello, Erica. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Daniel. Thank you very much for inviting me. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise, likewise. So we're talking today about making the leap into ESL teaching. Um, and as we do with all our guests, we just like to start by asking you, Erica, if you could talk a little bit about your journey into ESL teaching and what inspired you to pursue this as a career. Yeah, sure. So it's been a roller coaster, so starting from mm-hmm. the really beginning. Um, I'm originally from Italy, and after my degree, I entered the luxury hospitality field. Um, so I started working in Italy um, for the Dorchester Collection, and then in the UK, um, always for them. And in the UK is where I became a sommelier. I um, obtained my level two certificate in viticulture and enology. Uh, eventually, <laughs> me and the family moved to Singapore. And over here, I joined um, Four Seasons Hotel and Resorts, um, uh, you know, their corporate the corporate office um, as a sales system specialist. And oh. it was in Singapore during my years there when I stumbled into teaching um, was really by chance and I loved it to be honest. (laughs) 
So I, yeah, um, basically I was on a Facebook group uh, for foreigners in Singapore and there was this woman that approached me in my DM asking me if I could, you know, chat with her because her English was not great and um, she had just arrived so she was by herself, um, did not have anyone to talk to so I was like, yeah, why not? at that time, I was still home. We were not there for long. And so I remember that we would meet weekly for a couple of hours during my daughter's nap time. And, and we would literally talk through, you know, have a conversation. And um, and then at the end of our chat, I would give her my feedback. And, wow. you know, maybe, yeah, maybe, you know, just a couple of tips on, on grammar. And I would give her a little videos as a homework you know for the following week and and yeah that's that's how i started and from that time onwards really i randomly started receiving requests from different people like uh, can you please help me out and i i was actually was very joyful you know because it was something mm. that i i really liked um and then last autumn i, I came across uh your podcast and that was when uh, i started realizing okay i might can make a serious career out of this uh, passion of mine yes that's great that's wonderful and yeah. it's so nice you know i i did receive your emails and it was really encouraging to hear that you found them inspiring and useful and helpful and that it helped Indeed. you pursue this career path because I know now you're creating your own content, you have your own Instagram page, you're getting lots of uh, interaction there. So it's a really yeah. positive start. So I'm glad that we could help you on that journey, Erica. So yeah. um, tell us a little bit about how have you prepared yourself for the demands of teaching English as a second language? Um, and what specific training or qualifications have you obtained to help you with this? All right. Yeah. So I, to be honest with you, I went through a series of um, different courses and I have to be honest, um, out there on the internet, there is tons of stuff and it can be quite tricky and daunting at the beginning, understand what is worth and what having a look and what is not. Um, so I um, did a first the TESOL foundation course uh, online, um, also to have an idea, you know, like, okay, I want to pursue this as a career. Am I serious enough? Is it really what I want to do? You know, like, am I just enjoying it because I do it sometimes, but it's not my full-time job. So I, also because this is anyways a cost. I mean, let, let's face it, all these courses have a cost as well. And so I wanted to be sure, of course. And yeah, after this uh, initial uh, course that I did, um, I decided to enroll myself in a level five TESOL that I'm currently uh, about to finish. <laughs> uh, and I'm very, very happy about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is what I could do also because of my family, right? I have mm-hmm. two kids, they're still very young and I could not take time off going anywhere or even doing uh, lessons um, during certain time of the day. It was impossible for me um, because maybe I have, you know, to fetch them from school, prepare dinner, you know, it's literally yeah. real life things of that course, happens. Course. Yeah, I understand. And I, I, I think it's, you know, it's really encouraging. You decided that you want to take this seriously and you've gone out there to try and get qualifications because, you know, we always try to say to our listeners and to our teachers that, you know, qualifications are very useful. They give you the tools in your toolbox to be a better teacher, to be a more effective 100%. and efficient teacher. Now, you know, you can go all the way up to master's degrees and PhDs if you want to get really technical. But again, a lot of us practically cannot do that. Um, but it's definitely something to do is to look at training, even if it's for certain exams you want to prepare, like IELTS or um, TOEFL, for example, there's certifications and there's things you can do to help you prepare for those um, for sure. And TOEFL is, is the is is the great you know starting point and then we have things like Celta and Delta beyond that and TESOL diplomas so there's lots of things out there and it's really important because when you meet your students you can make sure you have the best lessons and you can give them you know not just 
classes that are going to help them, but classes that are actually going to meet their needs, their level and help them progress. That's what it's all about. So it sounds amazing that you've kind of in a short time, you've already had this very, you know, interesting and unique journey. So what are some of the challenges you faced, Erica, um, teaching ESL so far and, and how have you overcome them? Uh, yeah, so I I still am at the starting point of <laughs> my ESL journey, right? Um, generally speaking, there are many obstacles that um, I came across, you know, and I still every day uh, find the students juggling uh, the teaching with the frenetic social media uh, mm -hmm. world and advertising the business and being the admin <laughs> of the business, uh, right. finding and creating, you know, engaging materials, uh, good work life balance. I could mention maybe even many more, you know, but what really helps me at the end of the day is uh, maybe there are some resources that I can find on the internet or community of uh, like-minded uh, professionals, you know, um, and podcasts like yours uh, that make me feel part of something, a reality, right? Uh, this is the power of a uh, storytelling sharing experiences mm -hmm. and somehow in every single episode of your podcast i yeah. i can see a little bit of me to be honest right, and i right. suppose that this is what happen to many other listeners um yeah yeah, I yeah, think so. so. I think the community, you know, again, it's something we really stress. Community is key and having people around you who've been through the journey who can help you and give you, you know, tips and, and advice and put you in the right direction is really useful. And again, I'm, I'm really glad that you that you feel that our, our content resonates with you. Um, and again, yeah. I know a lot of people do find it useful. And, and I think it just shows that you're not alone, like everyone's going through this journey and we're all at different points. But at every step of the journey, you know, there's, there's things you can do to always improve, which is which is wonderful. Um, so yeah, of that's course. a great reflection. So how would you describe your teaching style and what are some strategies did you find uh, that were engaging for your students? Right, so um, maybe because of my previous career and my background in hospitality, um, I possibly approach my lessons and my styles a little bit in an unconventional kind of way, mm. I guess. Um, so I usually let my students talk freely at the beginning okay. of our classes so I can understand their mood. <clears throat> right. If they are in their talkative mood, if they are a little bit more introvert that day or what's going on. Uh, generally speaking, I tend to plan um, my class let's say my classes in a kind of dynamic way mm -hmm. right um i want them to of course to focus on what they need what they want not just because we have four skills then you know giving to give to every skill to each skill like the same amount of time depending on their needs and then we're gonna tackle each one in a in a different way uh, for different um, time. Um, usually, the, the speaking is the time that we focus a little bit more uh, because, like right now, everyone that um, I met happened to be very interested in conversation, which I understand because um, back in the days when I was, uh, you know, studying myself in high school and stuff like that, that was possibly the skill that was lacking in classes. And these are people that had my same possibly background <clears throat> in terms of being um, silent during the classes, listening to somebody else. And so they did not have that practice, that time, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, usually I just, you know, uh, prepare a few activities, uh, reading an article, maybe some comprehension from there. We learn some target language and we drill a little bit into the target language. And then I plan exercises like, you know, matching sentences. So column mm -hmm. A, column B, match the um, the sentence, gap filling, um, but what I like and what they usually like is role plays <laughs> where yeah. we imagine real life situation or maybe um, they tell me something that really happened to them and 
maybe they could not answer or they could not say what they wanted to say. And then, you know, after days, they were like, oh, I should have said that. Or, you know, now that I know that I, I should have um, uh, approached the situation in a different kind of way. So we try to focus on these kind of um, moments, events, and uh, build confidence on, on these. Yeah, I see. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's nice that you can relate from, you know, from yourself growing up in another country and learning other languages, you can kind of identify with that. So, yeah, um, you know, you mentioned that you worked in and, and lived in Singapore for a while and you were teaching there. So that's a very yeah. different cultural context to Italy or the UK where you are now. So how do you adapt your teaching approach depending on the background or the culture of your students? Right. So I have to say that um, generally I teach adults, uh, not children. The children that I teach mostly are my children. <laughs> um, uh, but even though, so I taught for um, in, in Singapore, but I have to say I mainly been doing this online. So despite being in Singapore or wherever in the world, you need to adapt you know, to different cultures because maybe you're in Singapore, but then the, the students is, I don't know, in South Africa, mm -hmm. you know. So I believe anyway, there is also always, you know, a, um, a point where you need to challenge yourself. And I think in general, coming from a, like, respectful uh, and understanding point of um point of view and promoting differences you know and as something fascinating to learn about is a good way to approach like a culture that we might be um uh, you know not familiar with mm -hmm. um a lot of my students are business english students but some others are general english and for instance if i have um, somebody that wants to study general english i might approach in my first lessons, uh, or maybe really the first one, uh, food, because <laughs> I find that food has a, really the power of bringing everyone together in a very convivial and likable conversation. And um, and food, you know, like um, if we talk about food like that, it can seem a little bit, you know, can can seem a little bit mundane as a as a topic, but. I believe that always depends on the context, like how we approach the topic. Right. We can be very specific. We can work on vocabulary that, uh, you know, like only the professionists know, you know, like, <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And common topics are a really good way to connect and to bridge the gap among cultures. And, you know, it's great for food, especially. It's great for comparing, describing, contrasting, talking about similarities and differences. You know, for example, the food in Italy versus the food in the UK, you can make a lot of comparisons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and talk about how great it is in Italy and how terrible it is in the UK. So that's a well, but in the UK, we're very lucky because we have a lot of, you know, influences from different cultures. So right. luckily, we have a lot of good food. Luckily, anyway. yeah. Good save. Nice save, Erica. Okay, so one challenge then, you know, that as a new teacher or you're starting out and, you know, making the mm -hmm. leap into ESL teaching um, is assessing students' level. And, you know, they'll, they'll ask you, what's my level? How good am I at this? You know, what would you say is my proficiency? So how would you do this? And what are some tools or techniques that, you know, newer teachers could use to help them? All right. So it's, it's not easy, to be honest. And thanks goodness, I decided to do these courses and, you know, to uh, dig a deep a bit deeper uh, on these kind of um, subjects because um, I usually assess my students for the very first time we have like a very informal chat right in English um, this is a smart way to get to know each other um, know their hobbies you know so I can even personalize the the classes you know on what they want to do what they like and and everything um, makes more sense for them uh, also I need to understand their personalities you know and um, what they want to gain from me in my course 
uh, ultimately. Um, I, I know that we have a, um, a few tools like, you know, Cambridge, um, Cambridge website has like a test your English page, yes. right? Yes. Which is pretty nice to be honest. But what I noticed is that a few students, they lacking confidence. And when they do these kind of tests, it's not good for them. They just come back to me, oh, I, I've been doing um, horribly because, you know, like um, I'm very down. I just scored this much and I hope that I, I would have scored like this much. And so I, I usually... Um, and this I do even during the courses, like I assess them, I assess them um, against the general guidelines that we have. For example, I know that an upper intermediate student uh, should know how to use the second conditional, use the perfect um, and perfect continuous sentences. And if I uh, talk to these learner and I see that they can consistently um, use those forms, I can say, okay, we are starting from an upper intermediate and now we can build on. We can do, mm -hmm. I don't know, phrasal verbs, third conditionals, idioms, all these things that you may be lacking, you know, on right now. So yep. I hope that that made sense. Um, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of tools. And like you mentioned, um, I know Oxford um, uh, or Cambridge, um, I, I know they both actually have um, different yeah, possibly, tests, yeah. grammar tests, um, simple proficiency tests, ways to test your English. There's a lot of tools out there. I mean, if you, if you just do a simple Google search, test my English score, you'll find a lot of tools there as a beginner teacher so you can start working with your student. And like you said, I think it's really important what you mentioned, Erica, just because a student feels their level isn't good, you know, they're not a number and you're working on their confidence, their skills, their, mm -hmm. their motivation, um, you know, these are really important. Um, so let's continue this idea of motivation. What strategies do you use to motivate and inspire your students, you know, especially those who might be struggling or might lack confidence? What are some ways to help bridge that gap? Yeah, so um, I have um, mainly, um, I had intermediate level students right um or within that range from the pre-intermediate intermediate upper intermediate that is what i came across um as of right now to be honest um it can be challenging as a um for a student when they have a wide level gap for instance in one skill or another and uh, for instance their speaking skill is not that good but the reading is uh, perfect you know um, depending on their personality and um, what is their goals basically uh, I, I use maybe different techniques um, one of those could be well First of all, I always explain to them why we do those exercises, right? Sometimes yeah. they look at me like, oh my goodness, you're crazy. Why do you make me talk so much? No, but <laughs> why is so important. You need to explain how it exactly. relates Exactly. So I, I always tell them why we do some things and um, they are not always very happy at the beginning because they, you know, I find that these students in the intermediate level, they really lack in confidence, mm -hmm. okay? I don't know what happens. I think that around the intermediate level, there is a kind of stagnant situation yeah, where they feel that they're not progressing. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have the plateau because it's easy to make progress at lower levels, but once you hit those higher levels, it's, it's, it's not as noticeable the progress that you make. Exactly. Yes. So depending on what they want to do, I may tell them to uh, repeat things out loud, right? When they read, repeat out loud. And then I send them recording like today, this morning, I spend the morning, uh, recording myself <laughs> and I sent all these recording to my students so they can listen to the recording and then they can repeat out loud um, because I explained to them basically that we need to create a connection between our brain and our tongue that could be deeper with you know uh, lips and tongue whatever but it's just easier for them to 
get to understand. And so I explained to them this connection. And if we don't connect these two, even though you can read it perfectly inside your mind, the first time that you're going to pronounce this word, you're going to blurb her out in a kind of way that it will be impossible for other people to understand you. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to mention and, and to make those connections as well. And this is something that I really, I really wish I still had the motivation to do as a new teacher when I started out was taking hours and hours to perfect your craft and to get better and to want to know more and to want to be better and recording takes so long. I know how long it takes know. You know, making this podcast and making edits. And again, to all the listeners, I'm so sorry because sometimes I make mistakes. I, I miss things. I, you know, I, I don't take things out that I should. So I know how difficult it is, especially as a new teacher. Um, so it's really important to, to, you know, keep working on these things, building up your skills, building up your confidence as well as a teacher. And yeah. I know students really appreciate that, Erica. So how do you um, stay up to date with latest developments and trends in ESL teaching? You know, what resources do you use to help you teach? Right. So um, I found, I came across the British Council website mm -hmm. and I found that they have a few courses uh, which is a uh, pretty nice because most of them are free mm -hmm. and uh, they can really inspire you somehow right um there was one that was saying something like uh the skills that an online teacher should have yes. uh in 2023 for instance mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh so there are all these courses and i um, so i usually take those courses um those courses are um, live for like four weeks and you can have like a kind of forum with other teachers. So you can actually share the experience, you know, uh, which is very important, I believe. Also earlier in our interview, you mentioned that you know, I did these courses, but there is the uh, Delta, the Celta, masters and stuff like that. So I decided to pace myself and keep in mind all these courses. And I have a few goals, for instance, within five years down the line, I would like to enroll in a master um, in linguistic, you know, and this is gonna be one of the things that will keep me up to date. Uh, you know, in two years time, I would like to take the uh, CELTA you know, and this is another. Uh, so in this way, I believe somebody like me, especially that is not fresh from, you know, a degree and um, has a few things to um, look at before um, being able to enroll in a course and stuff like that. Uh, it can be very helpful, you know, it, it can be doable at that point. Um, what I want to remember and what I have to stress myself as well to remember is that I cannot do everything in once. No. I am such a perfectionist. I want to know everything. I want to give the best to my students because I, you know, I think that teacher had that imposter syndrome, you know, that we feel we that do. if we don't, <laughs> if we don't have the yeah. best degree, if we don't have the best knowledge of everything, then we should not teach, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, but... it's, it's not the most important thing. Like it is helpful, but it's not <clears throat> the most important thing. It's just like, you know, if I want to climb a mountain and I've never climbed a mountain before and I don't have the right equipment and I don't have people to guide me and I don't know what the weather's going to be like and I don't know how much food I'm going to need, mm. then I can do it, but it's very exhausting and difficult and stressful and I have to you know, think about so many things. But if I do training programs, if I take time to reflect, if I get feedback from my students, if I develop my own materials, if I reflect on those materials, if I take a CELTA, take a DELTA, do a, it takes time, it's a process. So that exactly. after five, 10, 15, 20 years, you are able to adapt and be flexible and work with most students and be easily you know, able to in your mind know, okay, I'm gonna do ABC or I can do this today or this might work or this isn't gonna work or I can do this. So it's a lot of trial and error. And and I think you've, you've actually stumbled on something very, very important for new teachers. Um, and a lot of, I know a, new, a lot of newer, newer teachers listen um, to us is 
like you said, Erica, don't try to do everything at once. Set goals. Um, I usually say a, a three, two, one goal. What I mean is something you want to do in three months, something you want to do in six months, something you want to do in one year. So yeah. a short-term goal that you can be working towards consistently and, and quickly and seeing progress. A medium-term goal that maybe, you know, takes a little bit more time, but you'll get there. And then a one-year goal. And then you can, you can you know, you can make it as uh, however you want. One year, two years, three years. Set yourself goals that are realistic. Um, work towards them and, you know, be flexible with them. And, and you'll make progress and you'll start achieving your goals. You know, I never thought, you know, like you that i would be doing this now i never thought that i would be doing a podcast now that would that's actually you know doing well so it it's a lot of you know a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of stress and when you have a family as well i can only imagine how difficult it is to balance <laughs> those demands as well so yeah. how do you do this erica how do you balance the demands of teaching recording all your content managing your children, your family, the rest of your life? Like what strategies or tools do you use to help you manage your workload? I think that I should pass this question to somebody that actually get it all together. Because okay. <laughs> no, I mean, no, honestly, I I think that is a, always a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, but as a person, I'm quite organized. I've always yes. been quite organized um, mm -hmm. and I love it. And I believe that that is a skill that everyone, that, especially, you know, if you're self-employed or freelancing, needs to develop at some point <laughs> in order to manage the load, you know, um, that is one thing. And then, you know, just try to find some little time for yourself that can be even five minutes at the end of the day, um, meditating, inspire, you know, to inspire new ideas or just, you know, gain a bit of stillness uh, after a hectic, hectic day. Um, yeah, those are little things uh, because as you said, I I have a family, so it's, it's not easy, you know, and, and just what I said earlier, the five years goals that I have is because mm -hmm. by that time, I know that my daughter will be 10 and, you know, my son <laughs> will be seven and, and then we can work right. better on everything. And at that point, they will still need me, but not as much as um, they do now. And, and so, you know, I can approach different things in, in life, right? Um, yep. But yeah, so I I usually am quite organized with, with what I do with my schedule during the week, and yeah, let's try to go through that. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's that's the best advice. Be organized. Try to schedule your time really well. Um, I have lots and lots of blocks in my calendar every day for everything, and you know sometimes I'm a little bit late. Uh, you know, and sometimes <laughs> I'm a little bit behind schedule, or I miss things, or I move things around. So I would say be very organized, have a good schedule, have some flexibility, have some slots, some gaps for yourself to help you each day, um, and just you know try to do the best you can with your time. I think that's really important as well. Um, yeah. So so Erica, like you know, for new teachers or teachers who are just starting out or they're thinking about getting into ESL teaching, mm -hmm. what's some advice or some tips that you would share with them, you know, yourself having gone through this journey quite recently? Uh, yeah, so, well, I, I could possibly um, sound like repetitive, but to be honest, um, this change does not need to be a full uh, career change all in once. You know, it took me um, a few years, actually five years before <laughs> I realized that I could do this and um, I could approach it as a self-employed in uh, full time. Um, you can progressively move from one career to another. And, you know, if you connect with people in similar situations, um, can make life easier you yeah. know they might have a few advice i i for instance connected with uh, kate from balancing teachers mm -hmm. and and she gave me amazing advice and i was i i was very happy you know like i was like yes finally i have a person that can understand what i'm going through and galina as well um you know so yeah, 
find your community and one step at a time. <laughs> That's great advice. And yeah, you know, um, I, I see you've mentioned some of our previous guests who I connected with. Yes. The potential is, is amazing because through this podcast, I've met so many wonderful teachers who I've been able to keep in touch with and collaborate with and work with and network with. And it's been an amazing opportunity. And, and there's things that you can learn from others that you th never ever thought about or you never thought oh yeah actually why did i never think of that or that's a really easy thing i can do so this is Absolutely. really 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 important and very key as well this is great okay um i know again erica your journey hasn't been you know that long relatively speaking but you still obviously done quite a lot in a short amount of time um so what would you say is the most important thing you've learned on this journey or what is one thing you've learned that you wish you were more prepared for or that you know maybe you could advise others to be more prepared for hmm, that's interesting um so um new people um new people for me is like um meeting new people is very important okay. you know so be open that that is one thing that I've always been there, open to meet new people, new cultures, um, new things happening. Um, one thing that I wished I knew, um, <laughs> if ever one, <laughs> I wished I knew um, that right now I would have been, you know, in this situation. And so possibly I could have... Um, had a different um degree you know uh i yeah i would have chosen a different degree 100 percent. something that i really really liked and mm -hmm. not something that i did because i felt that at that point in my life it was the best thing to get a job yes so I, I, my I degree is like in food science and nutrition and mm -hmm. i liked it i liked it at the time but then I did not pursue that career, if you know what I mean. I know exactly um, what you mean. A lot of teachers and... took took that same that same path, Erica, and a lot of people didn't realize this is what they wanted to do. But that's the beautiful thing about teaching. You can you can do it anytime. Absolutely. And then, you know, the pro of it is that I had this uh, past life in hospitality. And now <laughs> I can actually assist people, you know, in that field as well. Mm -hmm and so that's cool yeah i think that's a great great point and the great message is never too late and you know you, you can definitely do it um if there's something you want to do and it doesn't have to be a full-time 50 hour a week commitment it can be something you start off slowly and and build up gradually that's wonderful great advice for new teachers there erica so um where can our listeners connect with you and where can they find out more about you and, and what they do or what you do yeah you know? <laughs> so I am still building my website, uh, but I have an Instagram page, Instagram account at underscore learning with Erica. And I have an email address, which is start at learning with Erica.co.uk. And yeah, so if you want to connect with me, it's going to be a pleasure <laughs> i will add those in the description of the show so you'll find those just underneath your icons on your Thank podcast you. player all right well that was a very insightful and very interesting and useful um chat erica thank you so much uh with your um for giving you your advice for new teachers and um yeah please do connect with erica if you would like to learn more thank you so much thank you very much so once again another big thank you to erica for joining us on this week's episode sharing her journey of how she made the leap into ESL and the challenges she faced, but she actually overcame them and she's now starting her new career as an online ESL teacher. So I hope you found that quite um, useful and inspirational as well. All right, before we wrap up for another episode this week, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at ESL Talk Podcast. You can send us an email if you have any questions to eslTalkPodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us online at esl-talk.com, our website, where you can apply to be a guest, find all of our previous episodes for free. And you can also follow us on YouTube as well. Just search ESL Talk Podcast and subscribe where you can watch and listen to all of our previous episodes too. So that is it for this week. We'll be back again next week for another brand new episode. Thank you so much for joining us and see you soon on ESL Talk. Bye-bye.